All right, welcome everyone. Here we are on our third installment of the ancient triennial cycle Drashot, based on the Parshiot in the ancient Masora. So I hope you guys have been following okay. Um, I, uh, I wanted to show you, maybe I'll just show at the end, I don't want to eat up our time on the teaching. If there's time at the end, remind me to show you our new channel. The old channel's not been abandoned, but the new one is dedicated to the triennial parsha. So what we're doing to make the teachings about the right length on Shabbat, I'm going to, I'll, I'll be stepping through some of the verses with you. And then on Sundays in our intermediate uh, two, our Shemot level two Hebrew class, we're going through going to go be going through more of the parsha, and that's open invite to anyone who wants to come and observe. The Hebrew students will be translating with a little bit of assistance by me, but mostly they do the translation, and then I comment, but we also have drosh style type comments, so that'll be for those of you who are thirsty for some more learning, and then as time permits in the week, I'll add more. So what happens is our Shabbat drosh is uploaded in three or four parts, 15 to 30 minute chunks is the goal, and you can see them on the new channel throughout the week as they show up if you subscribe to our Torah PH channel, and then... The additional follow-on teaching that comes on Sunday is added to that in three or four chunks. And again, as time permits, I'll be filling in the missing verses from the other draft show. They'll each be their own playlist. So in the future, if you want to go back and check out Breshit, right, like there are a few verses we didn't get to, hopefully I'll have time to fill those in, and those will be showing up as well. So eventually, we'll have the whole Torah step through, translated, explained, and discussed. Okay? That's kind of the vision with that, to take advantage of this three-and-a-half-year cycle so we can really have a nice resource. And I've been... Um, well, remind me at the end to show you how I'm trying to annotate the descriptions. So if you don't have time to listen to, say you heard the Josh on Shabbat, and you thought, ah, oh, what was that that he said about, ah, uh, you know, tohu vavohu, I missed it. I missed that. What was that? Well, a few of the Josh old, I've annotated the descriptions in the YouTube field with time codes. So I'm trying to break that down to fill that in over time. So you can click on the description to expand, and you'll be able to see and look for the subject you're looking for, and then click on that time code and jump to the place in the drosh so you don't have to hear the whole thing again, okay? And eventually we'll have a tool, Bezrat Hashem there that will be able to search this kind of stuff, maybe like a, an app or something, okay? Yeah, remind me at the end, Yehoshua. I'm going to show, but I want to show it at the end so everybody's here, uh, even the slackers. I mean, even those who come in late. <laughs> so, and I don't eat up our drosh time on it too because my goal is to have a certain chewable, digestible size here for everybody, okay? So please remind me at the end, and I'll show I'll show how all that is done, okay? All right. So let's get to it. Today's Torah portion is called Hain Adam. Behold man, right? Or behold the man. So that's what we're calling the topic, and uh, this forms a very interesting Gezer Shava with a verse in the apostolic writings. I'm not sure if you guys saw that yet or not from the, the Josh this morning or not, but uh, I don't know if uh, Brother Tony went into that, but uh, if you did, then great, you got an idea. And if not, then we'll do the connection here. For, uh, we're so blessed to have so many teachers. Please make sure to pray for our teachers. You know, when we're preparing to give these teachings, it's not always easy, and there's some additional strain when it's a shorter Torah portion, right? So please always pray for them. Pray, pray for all of us that the wisdom of Hashem comes on us and that we're able to, to really connect not only with the text, but with you guys, what it is that Hashem wants His people to hear that week. All right? So, all right, let's get into it. All right, so let's get started. Here is the reading for this week's Parsha. In case you didn't notice, I corrected my spelling. I noticed I didn't spell the error there. Oops. <laughs> so here it is. It's Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, through the end of chapter 4. And I 
It might be a typo. I think it's 26 verses, not 36 there. So anyway, you have a look. The Haftra starts in Ezekiel 28, 13. So we still don't have the full official researched Haftra verses. We only have where the Masorah indicates that they start at. The rule of thumb is it's about 10 verses unless it ends on an angry note or like a judgmental note. Um, those who read the Haftra in ancient times, they like to end on a happy note. So maybe it's 12 verses, maybe it's 8. You, we adjust it so that it ends on a good note, right? But after all, Torah can end however it is. <laughs> okay, this was just putting up again since many keep asking for it. Uh, I've transcribed the first so few months. Maybe I'll do the rest soon. Anyway, so there's our Torah readings on the left. Take a screenshot if you didn't do it yet. Right, so you can see. So, for example, next week we will start on 5 verse 1. Torah portion, Zesefe Toldot, something or other. I have to look see it next. Okay? All right. Okay, and here we are. I just wanted to show you again the Masorah, but this time for today. So there's that's actually the older one. I'm not sure why it's still. I thought I deleted that. Let's see. Uh, yeah, here it is. Okay. So you see in the Masorah, here we have this little special marker here. This shows where our Torah portion starts today. So these are marked in the ancient Torah tradition, right? They're, they're in there. This isn't just something that we're making up. We're not like the Masorti movement, just trying to, how can we make this thing shorter? And they, one year they do the first third, the next year they do the second third, the next year they do the third third. And so it's all kind of all out of order in everybody's memory. No, but you see this little special marker here? That shows us that this is where the Torah portion starts. Okay. And if you look down, the way Torah portions are usually named, they're named by the first few... Uh, significant phrases in the Torah portion, right? So, okay. All right, so here's the background picture for the first slide. Thought some of you might find this interesting. There are various traditions and cultures that have stories about the tree of life, the Eitz HaChayim, which we'll discuss a little bit today, not a whole lot, but a bit. But so that's kind of the background theme. This is a, a, a piece of artwork from Azerbaijan, where... Uh, so that'll be, in case you're wondering what's in the background of the next slide, what's going on. That is what's going on. All right. So here we are. Parsha starts. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 22. And let's get with it. Vayomer Adonai Elohim Hein Hadam and we stop here with our little semicolon. That's a, that's a Hebrew semicolon. You can think of it that way. The little wishbone guy on the bottom there. That's etnachta or atnach. Okay? So, vayomer Adonai Elohim. Then, Adonai Elohim. Literally, literally is what it says. Adonai God said. Here's what he said. Behold... Ha'adam, the man. Yeah, it looks like I left off the hay on the title of the thing. Sorry, guys. You know, we're not used to these triennial partiality. A lot of them have different names from the ones that we've been doing every year on. So that's why I, I accidentally typed Hain Adam instead of Hain Ha'adam. Behold the man, which is actually a much better Gezer Shava for what I want to do when coming into the Apostolic Writings, you know, where we where we have, uh, where it says, uh, Idu Ha'anthropu. Behold the man, right? So so it's actually a much better connection with ha, the ha being there today. And this is going to be the, the Hebrew letter for this week. For those of you who have not yet learned the alphabet, last week your assignment was to learn sheen. That made a sh sound. And I'm not taking up a lot of time for this because most of you should know this. But if you don't know, sheen you had to know. Go look at, go watch last week's Parsha if you need to see it. This week it is hey. And here is the letter hey. See it here? I'll make it yellow. Learn this letter. So it looks kind of like a little angle, like a corner of a square. And then we have another line here, and then there's some space in between, right? Okay, that is an H sound. Ha, like ha. Like ha, ha, ha. You could write it with that letter, okay? So that's letter Hey, Those of you who, are not, who have not learned the alphabet yet, learn your second letter, please. And I am teaching them out of order because I figured a lot of people probably already know alphabet Gimel Dalit, and then maybe the rest they stopped or whatever, so who knows? But a lot of you have gone deeper in Bruch for that. I mean, Bruch Hashem for that. I'm really glad. Okay, so behold the man. 
So this, of course, I, I, for me, I could not think of, of a Gezer Shava making a connection. Gezer Shava is the rabbinical method of connecting text through similar phrases or the same phrases. That there's some kind of spiritual reason for the text to be connected. Right? So, the connection here is, behold the man. All right, so I'm going to read to you from the Besorah Yohanan. That's the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 5 to 6. But not my translation. This is Dr. Stern's translation. It says, So Yeshua came out, wearing the thorn branch crown and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Okay, so he translates, look at the man. I should have translated myself. Ah, I just grabbed it kind of in her. <laughs> okay. In the Greek, it says, Idui, which can mean look. The, the, the Hebrew, Hain, also can mean look. In fact, if you read my translation of Genesis, oftentimes I say look, notice, observe, right? Although traditionally, the older language translation is behold, hine, behold, right? So this word here, this hain, this is the one that maps to this word that Stern is translating look in Greek. Idu in Greek, hine, look, observe. Okay, and of course we have Ha'adam, the man, and the man. There's no at there in the Greek. That's just to make the English sound okay. Behold the man, idu ho'anthropos. Right. That's what that's what Pilate is saying. At least in, that's as the text transmits down to us in Greek. When the head Kohanim and the temple guard saw him, they shouted, "Put him to death on the stake! Put him to death on the stake!" Or star out zoo in the Greek, crucify him. Right? Literally it's crucify. And in case you're wondering why Stern uses this kind of language, you know, throughout the centuries, the cross has been a symbol of persecution to Jewish people. Right? When we see a cross, it's like reminds us of the evil Martin Luther, you know, the father of the Protestant movement, so called father of the Protestant movement, you know, and how he persecuted Jews and thousands of Jews died at his order because he convinced the ruler of the leader of Saxony to kick us out in the middle of winter time. Yay! Thank you, Martin Luther. You're such a great guy. And, and he murdered the Anabaptists because they had a different theology than him. He, he gave the command to drown many of the Anabaptists. So there's lots of wicked stuff in this guy. So when we see the cross, it reminds us of the wickedness of Protestantism's fathers, the wickedness of the Catholic Church, which persecuted us, burned Jews at the stake, tortured us during the Inquisition and to try to make us become Roman Catholics. And then if we did become Roman Catholics, we were called Moranos. It was like swine, right? So the forced converts were the swine. Yeah, and they would come to our house and make sure, you know, make sure Friday night we're not eating chicken, right? You know, because chicken, chicken is traditional in many homes, or it was in European Jewish homes, because, you know, it's like to, to slaughter the chicken, it's an expensive item, right? Versus cheaper fish, which the Catholics often would eat in order to help the fishing industry. And, you know, they come and make sure we're eating right, making sure we're not observing Sabbath, Right, making sure we're not observing any new moons or fall. There was really like enforcement, anti torn force. So, so for Jews, a lot of times the cross this is not a really nice thing. This is a symbol of anti Semitism, right? And to me, it's amazing that it ever became the symbol of a religion. I mean, could you imagine if like Yeshua came today and this was his first coming? And let's say he came to Texas and let's say the Texans killed him. Well, it wouldn't be crucifixion, would it? It'd probably be the electric chair or lethal injection. Could you imagine? Say it's lethal injection. Could you imagine then, like, all his followers, his Gentile followers, rather, they started wearing needles around their neck, you know, like putting needles on their churches, you know, putting needles on their car bumper stickers and needles on T-shirts, you know, it's like... To me, it's just insanity how this ever happened. Like, yay! He got murdered! Yay! So, so what happens is, the older generation of Messianic Jews, Dr. Stern and his generation, they shy away from anything about the cross, right? Which I understand totally. You know, it's kind of taboo, right? In Messianic circles. Like, you're not going to go to a Messianic congregation and find a cross, unless it belongs to the church that they're renting from, right? Find a cross on the steeple or, you know, in the room or anything like that. Like, the first Messianic synagogue I used to go to in Boston when I was a college student, I remember we, uh, uh, I remember they, they, they actually owned the building, but they rented it to uh, a Baptist organization during the week, right? To kind of help make the payments. And so the, the Baptists, when they, uh, and the Mennonites, there were Mennonites who rented the sanctuary for Sunday, right? So, so the Mennonites, they would actually put up 
crosses and stuff like that, I think. They would hang it up, but they had to take it down so it wasn't there when the Jews showed up. And then we would put up our Stars of David. <laughs> just kind of, anyway, so it's sensitivity to persecution and all that stuff. So that's why he's translating that way. All right. Put him to death, put him to death, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, you take him out yourselves and put him to death on the stake, crucify him, because I don't find any case against him. Right. So, of course, this, going back to the beginning, after the fall of man, right? man in last week's parsha at the end, you know, he already committed sin, as did his wife Chawa. They did the sin, and so now we're following up with that, the consequences of the sin. And so the nice Gezer Shabbat, the connection this gets us in the Apostolic Writings in Masoret Yochanan, the Gospel of John, is Yeshua is the stand-in for that man, right? Just by the first man, as we're told by Rav Shaul, took the fall, the, uh, caused, quote-unquote, the fall of the second man also, that is Yeshua HaMashiach, the second man, Paul Anthropos in the Greek, he now takes the fall for the sins of mankind. Yeah, right, Janine, <laughs> the troublemaker Martin Luther. Indeed, indeed. And it's not like he was so greatly original. I mean, there was already great Reformation happening. You had Wycliffe and others who had already been persecuted did great things. He just basically took a lot of what they did and then... Uh, don't get me going on Luther. There's so much wickedness that's recorded that that guy did. I mean, so his books, if you ever look at his books in German, such filthy language he used. Like, you know, I don't want to say it, but if I say it in English, it'd be like, oh, what kind of a the spiritual teacher is this just really disgusting. You know, he made sure that the consummation with his wife was observed. Multiple guys watched them have sex on their bed. Yeah, I'm just a pervert and a weirdo and a sicko, a spiritually defunct. It is, and so it's crazy to me that today you talk to like modern Protestants and they'll be like, oh, Luther. Yeah, Luther, Luther. Oh, oh. They, they quote Luther in their commentaries. It's like, dude, the guy was a Russia. He's totally wicked. Don't be surprised if you hear a, a Jewish person hear Martin Luther in one breath, they'll say, Yemach Shemom, his name be blotted out from the book of life, because he's just such an evil man. So, all right, continue. By, your, by their works, you shall know them. All right, continuing on. Haya. So, then God, then Adonai God said, Behold the man, or look, the man, Haya, has become. So, this verb Haya can mean to be, or he presumes to become. He has become, Ke'achad Mimenu. Like one, literally like one from us, like one of us. So who's Hashem talking to? Right. Who's he talking to? <laughs> yeah, that's right, one of the bunch. That's right, Calvin was wicked. There's a lot of a lot to go around, right? These, these uh, you know, lawbreakers. So then co coming back around to it, so who's God talking to? No, it's not the Trinity, okay? He's not, he's not talking to Yeshua. He's not talking to the Holy Spirit, right? He's not, he's not talking to himself. He's not a crazy God, you know, because if you accept the concept of the complex plurality of God, he doesn't need to talk to himself, right? At least not when they're all hanging out together. He's talking to the heavenly host. Right? He's talking to the angels, right? The same ones to whom he said, let us make man in our likeness, right? In our image, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's who he's talking to, the heavenly host, because they live forever. Right? So that's the concern. That's also what Chawa was attracted to, was to be like them. Right? In the Hebrew text, when it says Kelohim, you know, when the, the Nachash tells her, you will be Kelohim. Oftentimes people interpret that like God, right? But I interpret that as like the divine ones, if you've seen my book on it. Like the, like the, like, i.e., like the angels, like the Nachash, etc. You're going to live forever like us. You'll be radiating light like we do, etc., etc. So that was her temptation. It wasn't quite as brazen as the Protestant traditional translations make it that she wants to be like God. Right? She actually wants to be like his other family members, his other children, the angels. That's who she wanted to be like. Right? So, so Chawa, despite her her wicked act, it's not quite as wicked as the traditional translations make it sound, right? She's not like, I'm gonna be God! <laughs> it's like, can you imagine? I'm gonna be God! <laughs> She's not that bad, okay? She's seduced and tempted by the beauty of this other creature that she doesn't understand. I mean, imagine, he's shiny, they fly, they can fly around. I mean, wouldn't you want to be like them? I would like to be like them. Okay, so Yahushua asks a question. He says, but when he says, let us make, isn't he consulting with the angels? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, the heavenly host, the angels. Why would he? 
isn't he sharing his glory with the angels when he said, I am Hashem, my glory, I give it. Okay, so I'm going to answer your question, not with my own answer, but with that of Dr. Heiser, right? So Dr. Michael Heiser writes in his book, Supernatural and the Unseen Realm, he explains this question. He says, basically, when Hashem says, when he says, let us make, I'll say, it's, this is a, uh, this is a cohorted of form, like, let's make it happen. Let's go do this, right? It's equivalent in Heiser's example to if all of you are hanging out with me, and I am going and I say, hey, let's go get some pizza, okay? Now, my plan is I'm the one who's driving, I'm taking you to the pizza parlor, and I'm buying the pizza, okay? Let's go. Let's go have some pizza. Let's go get some pizza, right? You're coming with me, and you're participating, and you're enjoying, and you're watching. So this is basically the, the, the example he uses to answer your question. hope that's okay, yeah? It's not sharing glory. He's just saying, hey, let's do it. He likes to involve his family. See, this is part of the divine council worldview, which we see all throughout the Bible. Right? When it's time for Ahav, the wicked king of Israel, who married the non-Jew Ye Jezreel, Jezreel, right? Jezreel, pardon me, Jezebel. He, uh, when it's time for him to die, God is meeting with his council of spirits, and he says that it's time for Ahav to die. How should we do it? And we're told in the text that a spirit comes before God, and he says, I will go before him as a lying spirit to his prophets, meaning to the prophets of Baal or whatever. And, I, and I'll convince him to go to war, and then we can kill him there. And God says, good idea. Right, this again, this is another Heiser example. But So you see, so this is how God likes to do things. He likes to involve his family. And that does not share his glory. He sends Hamashchit to do his bidding. He sends, you know, the angel to wrestle, the angel... Presumably, by our Midrash, he wrestles with Yaakov. The angel is the angel of, of Esau, his brother, right? The guardian angel. And so, so Hashem, it's not really sharing his glory. He's the creator, right? He's, like we say in the Siddur, he's Moshia, in Acher, Elo Umagen. He is the, Mashi he is the, uh, the uh, Savior, Moshia. And we have no other, we have no other Eloah, God. We have no other Magen, we have no other shield or suzerain, depending how you point that, right? So, if you say it in Hebrew, it does, Josh. Josh says, well, in English, bison pizza doesn't have a plural form, indicating the same, but it does. In biblical Hebrew, if I'm speaking biblical Hebrew and I say, let's go get some pizza, I say, not, I, if we're, let's say we're going up to Jerusalem, I say, not alay, not alay, you you see? Let us go up to Jerusalem to buy some pizza. Okay? Like not at ha pizza. So it does. It's the plural form. Let us do it. You see? In biblical Hebrew it does. Yeah, it's called the cohortative. First person plural. So the the speaker uses it. There's an alternative answer, but I don't think it's correct, but maybe it'll please you. Some say he's speaking in the majestic plural, right? As king, sometimes you like the queen of England, she might say, we are not pleased today, right? So she's not saying that she's a we, but it's the majestic plural. So that's another answer. Yeah. Well, you're speaking, you're doing modern Hebrew there. You're, oh, yeah. Nishpera, <laughs> let us buy nice. Well, well, that word actually, Yomar, is only for grain. So we can't really use it for pizza, Although I guess maybe it's a derivative of grain, right? right? Nishbara means let's go buy grain, specifically Shiber Shava, right, to buy grain. But still, you got it. That's a cohortative. Nice. Court of example, right? Right. Yeah, Josh says, because they were going with you, but the buying isn't right. Exactly. So Shem is doing the creation, but he's saying, hey, let's do this, right? And you see many examples of these throughout the, the Tanakh, right? We see where God tells people, well, tells beings, his spiritual beings, let's do this, let's do this, I'm going to do this. You know, you know. for example, sometimes, sometimes it gets really close to being Hashem, which is interesting. Like in the case, you remember when David HaMelech is tempted to count Israel? God's already mad at David, right? And so it says, God decided to put David to test, and, and he says, uh, I will test him. In Kings, in one of the Kings, I don't remember the exact verse, he says, I'm going to test him, right? But in, but in Chronicles, the exact same story says the Satan went to test David, right? So very clearly we do see God even involving his servants in his direct actions. And that doesn't really equate in sharing his glory. He's the one who's thinking it up. He's the one who's driving the bus, so to speak. But that was a nice topic. Thanks for bringing that up. Very interesting. Okay. As one of us or one from us. So Ibn Ezra comments on this. 
you will be like divine beings who know good and bad. This is supporting the view that I have in my translation of saying it's like divine beings, and also like Heiser is saying here, you know, about the divine council. So the temptation is Kelohim to be like divine beings, knowing good and bad. Or perhaps it is saying the man has become like one of us. So it could be, so Ibn Ezra saying the us in this case, it is divine beings. So it's back into this idea. It's not God, it's the divine beings. Those who live forever. The Da'at Tovorah, knowing Tovorah, who remembers what the idiom means? As my rabbi Jacob taught me when I was younger. Tovorah, according to my rabbi, was a Hebrew idiom meaning everything. Okay. So the knowledge of everything. Ha, that did not write on the screen, did it? <laughs> Let's try that again. Tovara. There we go. Mm. There we go now. It wants to. Tovara. Good and evil. Right? Probably a hendiadis, which means when you put the two words together, they have a new meaning together, as if it's one word. Tovara. Everything. That can mean everything. The tree of the knowledge of everything. So we already ate from that. So Hashem doesn't want to let it happen again with an X tree, right? And some of the commentators they say, well, why didn't he just say don't eat from that tree? Well, the, the sages they respond, because Hashem, out of mercy for Adam, he knew he would probably do it again, and so he didn't want to give him the chance to sin. In this case, he's protecting Adam from himself. The Ata Pen. Yishlach Nadoh Vakach Gam Oops, sorry, I got a little bit off on the tone there. Me'etz hachayim v'achal v'achay le'olam It's kind of hard to jump in the middle there. So, pen, it's kind of hard to bring that in modern English. It's like less, so that this doesn't happen. And now, so that this doesn't happen, what might happen? Yishlach Yolo. He might send out his hand. And I want you guys to remember this, Yishlach here, Yishlach, because we have a nice stylistic element that's going to come up soon in the following verses. Okay? Watch out for wordplay coming, forming in what's called an inclusion or an inclusio with this verse, coming up later. Yishlach. So the verb to watch out for is Shalach. There's our sheen from last week. You guys remember the sheen? Shh, that's the SH sound. Hope you did your homework if you don't know how to read Hebrew yet. Shh. Shalach. Shalach means to send. So he doesn't send out his hand. Vilakach, and also take or acquire. Gam eitz also from the tree of life. Vichal v'chay le'olam, and eat and live forever. So Dr. Vera asks, does everything mean omniscience? It's a good question. It's a good question. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. That's a very nice question. If somebody else has a good answer to that, please chime in. I'd like to learn. Also from the Tree of Life. So let's look at this Tree of Life here. So this is all happening in the garden, right? And it's interesting that, the, again, I think this is at least in concept a nice Gezer Shava with the Gospel of John, the Sot Yochanan, chapter 19, verse 41. It says, now in the place where he was crucified, I think this is ESV I copied from, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So do you guys see the symbolism here? How interesting that is? What's happening? So we have these events just happen in a garden, right? So I think that's ESC. We have these events happened. Death is introduced into the world, right? Into a garden. And now at the very place, the very location where Yeshua HaMashiach was crucified, we have a garden, right? Because why does the pet text bother to mention that there's a garden? When we're dealing with divinely inspired texts, there needs to be a reason. Right? And when we slow down and we look at the text and we look again at it, you know, like my book is called Genesis Look Again, right? We look again at the text. That looking again can help you to see stuff we've never seen, even if you've read it a hundred times, listened a hundred times, just changing our pace. 
So the text bothers to give us this detail. Yochanan thought it was important that we know this. And I think it's because it's tying back to the Gan Eden, right? The Garden of Eden. The death that happened there, we have the beautiful connection of life is happening through the death, through yet another death, this time of someone who's blameless. 